So my name is Jason Silva. I'm a filmmaker and I'm fascinated by big ideas. I find that some ideas are so big and so wondrous that, that they tend to be bigger than their usual dry academic packaging. And what I'm trying to do is to find ways to engage wider audiences to think about big ideas. So I'm a big fan of the TED conference. TED has been really successful at creating mimetic content that goes viral, that distills big ideas into 18 minute talks that people can watch, digest, and you know, hopefully change their perspective on how they see the world or some crazy notion of science and technology. So I'm particularly interested in what's known as the co-evolution of humans and technology and in to get people to think exponentially about what's happening with technology nowadays. Now, most people don't really understand this, but technology evolves at an exponential rate. And one of the ways that some of the most renowned futurists describe exponential rate is the following way. Our brains evolved in a world that was linear and local, but now we find ourselves in a world that is global and exponential. If you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, 30 steps later, you're at 30. But if you take those same amount of steps exponentially, you go 2, 4, 8, 16, 30 steps later, the same amount of steps, but exponentially, you're at a billion. So that's the difference. That's the reason that the cell phone in your pocket today is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. So what used to be half a building now fits in your pocket. In 25 years, it'll fit inside of your blood cells. So that's kind of exciting, right? <laughs> anyway, um, my mind is absolutely blown when I contemplate the radical transformations that technology is allowing, us, allowing to occur to the human condition. Cognitive philosopher Andy Clark refers to technology as a scaffolding that extends our thought, reach, and vision. He says it's our extended phenotype. He says it's our outsourced cognition. We need to get over our skin bag bias and see these tools as literally a part of who and what we are. We are a man-machine civilization. And I become so kind of inspired by this idea. I find it to be this wonderful antidote to existential despair because in many ways we're this creature that is born that can contemplate its own existence and dies. You know, death robs us of everything and everyone we care about. But we have this unique gift, which is creativity and imagination. Creativity and imagination allows us to conceive of delightful future possibilities, pick the most exciting of those possibilities, and then remix the present in order to pull it towards this amazing future possibility. So what I'm trying to do is capture these moments of inspiration, these big ideas, and distill them into these two-minute videos that I call Shots of Philosophical Espresso that over the last six months have gone totally viral. They've been seen way over a million times, and I've literally traveled the world talking about the power of imagination and technology to transform and augment the human condition. This video I'm going to show you today actually premiered at the TED Global Conference this past summer and also resulted in me uh, getting this gig hosting a TV show for National Geographic. So my hope is that it induces a state of awe. And awe, of course, is defined as any experience of such perceptual vastness that you literally have to reconfigure your mental models to assimilate the experience. So I'm trying to pull you out of context so that it forces you to gawk in amazement at the ubiquitous everyday wonders that we're culturally disposed to ignore. Thanks a lot, and have a look at radical openness. You know, I love this idea of radical openness, the free exchange of information, the free flow of ideas, creating spaces in which ideas can have sex, as Matt Ridley talks about. And this is huge because it turns out that ideas are just as real as the neurons they inhabit, as James Glick tells us. You know, a new kingdom rises above the biosphere. The denizens of this kingdom are ideas because ideas have retained some of the properties of organisms, it turns out. They leap from brain to brain. They compete for the limited resources of our attention. They have infectivity. They have spreading power. They are what Richard Dawkins calls the new replicators, born from the primordial soup of human culture. Their vector of transmission is language and electronic communications. And though ideas are not made of nucleic acid, they have achieved more evolutionary change and at a rate that leaves the old gene panting far behind. You know, Ray Kurzweil says our ability to create virtual models in our heads, combined with our modest looking thumbs, was sufficient to usher in a secondary force of evolution called technology. And it will continue until the entire universe is at our fingertips. This is unbelievable stuff. It speaks to the telescoping nature of evolutionary change. More change in the last hundred years than in the last billion years. Terence McKenna actually wrote that from the moment that human beings invented language, biological evolution essentially ceased and evolution became a cultural epigenetic phenomenon. Now, we take in matter of low organization, we put it through our mental filters, and we extrude it in the form of space shuttles and iPhones. 
You know, the imaginary foundation tells us that what imagination does is it allows us to conceive of delightful future possibilities, pick the most amazing one, and pull the present forward to meet it. You know, imagine how impoverished this world would have been if we hadn't invented the technology of the oil painting in time for Van Gogh, or the technology of the musical instrument in time for Beethoven and Mozart to unfurl through it, you know, with the revolutions in biotechnology, nanotechnology, the free exchange of information is allowing us to conceive of radical new things. Freeman Dyson says, in the future, new generation of artists will be writing genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron wrote verses. What is great in man, said Nietzsche, is that he is a bridge and not an end. You know, we're on a trajectory, smack in the middle between the born and the made, wrote Kevin Kelly. And so, radical openness, it's huge. It's a universe of possibility. It's gray infused by color. It's the invisible revealed. It's the mundane blown away by awe. We need to cultivate radical openness as a way of participating and accelerating evolution. Thanks so much, guys. Hopefully that uh, got your mind and your synapses firing like crazy. But really, these are meant to be just kind of these small nuggets, these meta-narratives to look at technology in a different way. And my goal is to really engage in a dialogue with people. So if that inspired you, they're all on my Vimeo page, vimeo.com slash Jason Silva, or you can connect with me on Twitter. I'm at Jason Silva. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>